Uh, let's see. So we got the sign-in sheet. Good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and open a prayer. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church and uh, for each and every believer here. Uh, uh, and we thank you for the fellowship and the love that we can enjoy together. And we thank you for this uh, wonderful Apostle John who gave us such an authoritative, profound, and moving work about the life of, of the Lagos, the Word. And uh, we pray that as we begin our study on this, that you will uh, be our teacher, walk among us, challenge and convict us, teach us about what you want us to know uh, about Jesus, the God-man. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, we are commencing the study of the Gospel of John. And they were making fun of me that I talked too loud, so I'm going to close this. So, uh, uh, are any of you with me for the first time? Never been on my Okay, well, uh, so uh, then by way of introduction, my name is Bob Leonard. Uh, I'm married to Suzanne behind the camera there. Uh, my daughter Layla is here with her boyfriend Mike. And uh, we live in Martinsburg, West Virginia. I'm a retired Army officer, and I work now at uh, the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, which really sounds impressive, but I'm really the dumbest person there, so it's not that impressive. So uh, um, we, uh, yeah, so we've been here since 2006, and uh, we just love this church. So this is, I, I sing this church's praises all the time. I think it's the best church I've ever been in, and uh, it's uh, because of folks like you. It's because of our elders and pastors and all the people, the deacons, uh, all the people that put in so much work. Uh, it's a great fellowship. And so we're uh, thankful and grateful for the opportunity to, to be able to teach here. Um, so what we're going to do is an exposition of the Gospel of John. And uh, it's uh, really, I suppose if this, you know, if you were somebody that knew nothing about the Bible, you knew nothing about God, you knew nothing about Christianity, this would be your first stop, this book. This book is explicitly written to unbelievers. It's one of the few books in the Bible intended for unbelievers as well as believers uh, because in this book it teaches in crystal clear terminology how you go from being unsaved hell bound to being saved heaven bound All right so it's a it's a perfect book for evangelization but it's also a book for believers there's much here for for uh, the life of the believer as well um, so, uh, is this going to work? Let's see, it doesn't look like it. Uh, so, um, let's talk about this book and where it came from. There is very strong evidence that this book is written by John, hence the name, The Gospel of John. Um, and I've got to turn my recorder on, how about that? They're going to be so mad at me. And I just got up a class, so they just gave us a class on it. Okay, let's see. Start over again. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> For the recording, we're starting over. Gospel of John. Um, so th this book does not include John's name. He didn't, he didn't say, you know, I'm John, I wrote the book. Uh, we have to uh, infer that, that the Apostle John wrote this book, but there's strong historical evidence that he did. As you will see as the book goes on, uh, clearly this is written by someone who was an eyewitness, a, a, a close, intimate friend of the Lord. And by process of elimination, uh, you know, you can determine that it's not Peter, it's not James, uh, and eventually it comes down to this is John. And all the early church fathers agreed John wrote this. Uh, and so they, they sort of had that knowledge secondhand through Irenaeus, and, uh, you know, pretty much everyone agrees with that. Some liberal scholars, uh, you know, sometimes take issue, but they take issue with everything, so who cares? Uh, but anyway, uh, so we believe this is written by uh, uh, John, the brother of James, son of Zebedee. Uh, you know, when did he write this? Uh, you know, the, the big question is, did he write it before 70 AD or after 70 AD? Why is that important? Pardon? Yeah, because of the, the, the sack of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. That's a very, you know, it's a huge issue obviously to both Jews and to Christians. Uh, of course, John does not mention it, 
Um, and so the, the question is, did it happen yet? Now, some scholars will you know, take the fact that he didn't talk about it, didn't mention it, and say, well, that indicates that uh, you know, he wrote it before 70 AD. Others will say, no, uh, it was, you know, in fact, most evangelical scholars believe that he wrote it later, much later than 70 AD, uh, somewhere between the, you know, perhaps the 80s and the 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, but here's what we can be sure of, and this is important, and that is that there is a second century papyrus that we have that makes clear reference to this gospel. Now, that's important because that absolutely puts the gospel, you know, in the, in the latter part of the first century, which is when the Apostle John would have written it. Okay, so it's, we, we have very clear archaeological evidence. This is a genuine gospel written by an apostle. Um, now, when you approach the book of John, how many of you are honest enough to admit that you've had trouble with the gospel of John before? Anybody? Anybody think it's a little bit weird? Yeah. So there's no honest people. Okay, all right, fine. That's all right. Yeah, I know. I saw it. <laughs> well, it's certainly it is different. It's a different. It's a different tone. It's a different uh, gospel in many ways, and this is why. This is why the the other three gospels are called the synoptics. Synoptic, same viewpoint. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. In fact, they, they make use of each other's words, verbiage, uh, in, in some cases. But John, the Gospel of John, is conspicuously different in tone, in the, in the material that he covers. Uh, it, it's just a different book. And his language is, is sometimes difficult to get your, your arms around. Um, you know, John, the, the Apostle John, wrote, wrote his Gospel. He also wrote this book called Revelation, which you may have heard of, for those of you who are in our Revelation class. And he wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, one scholar, I think, nailed it perfectly when he talked about how John writes. He said, you know, if you are used to reading the Pauline epistles, the epistles of Paul the Apostle, then you're used to a very, um, very clear logic. Paul takes you from, here's point A, now point B, point C, conclusion. If, therefore, it's, it's like you're in logic class when you're reading something that Paul wrote. Because he's a very logical, direct uh, thinker. John, on the other hand, is, has been described like a, like a vulture circling in the sky. You know, he's just kind of circling, and then he drops down and gets it, you know, kind of thing. It's just, his logic is not linear. His argumentation is not linear. He, he talks in a, you know, sort of a circular way about the point that he's trying to make and then makes the point. Um, so it's a different kind of logic. It's a different, you know, it requires a little bit different interpretive skills to understand where John is going uh, sometimes. But once you get used to that, you understand the way he writes, the way he thinks, then things become uh, uh, pretty clear. So we believe that, uh, you know, John wrote this gospel assuming that you have already read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we believe that. We, he doesn't say that. It's, it's something we have to infer. But as you look at the gospel, it, it's very clearly very selective. In fact, he even says that in the gospel. He says, you know, Jesus has done many things, many miraculous things, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life through his name. So that tells you John deliberately selected things with a purpose in mind. And based on that, we believe that he assumes that you've already read the Synoptic Gospels. You're familiar with the basics about, about the life of Christ. You know, scholars have a lot of time, or a lot of fun uh, speculating as to whether John himself had the Synoptic Gospels in front of him while he was writing? Did he use them? He did not quote them, but did he use them as he developed his material? We don't know. But most likely he assumed that his audience was familiar with the basics. The other thing that's, that's curious about John's Gospel is that it is a Gospel that, that very conspicuously has a 
a much wider world in view than, say, for example, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is written with, you know, with a Jewish audience in mind. Of course, Gentiles can, can understand and benefit from it, but it's a very Jew. Matthew is a very Jewish gospel with, a, with a, a, a very clear theme and thesis. And that thesis is Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the son of David. He is the king. That's Matthew's point. John, on the other hand, is looking at a much wider world. He's looking at, he's, look, he's writing late in the first century, and by this time, Christianity has come well beyond the borders of Palestine and is moving into the wider world and into a much more eclectic audience, including a Greek audience. And so this gospel is written with a Greek audience in mind as well as a Jewish audience. Okay, so again, very different from, uh, from the other gospels in that respect. If this is not gonna work, so there we go. So this is uh, the verse I was referring to, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He says this, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Very powerful verse. This is John, the author, very frankly telling you, this is why I wrote, and this is why I selected these things. This is the thesis of this book, that you may believe uh, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, when he says, these are written, he's referring, because he mentions up here, look, there were many signs that he did, many signs that he did. Many miraculous things. <laughs> but these miracles, that's what he's talking about here. These miracles, the ones I recorded in this book, and if you've, you know, if you've studied the Gospel of John or you have a study guide, it'll mention that there are seven miracles. But we, you know, we add another one and make it eight because we count the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ as, as another miracle. So there are eight very clearly miraculous events in the Gospel of John that happened in the life of Christ that Jesus or that John is saying I'm going to give you a detailed account of these eight things because I want you to come to this conclusion that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that by believing that you may have life through his name okay questions about that any thoughts on that Yes, the rich. What do you think? Uh, well, yeah, you mentioned the signs. In fact, he uses the word signs throughout this God yeah. to indicate the miracles. Absolutely. He doesn't usually use that word miracles. He uses the word signs. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Rich makes the point that that uh, you know the the terminology, the, the word sign, is something that John favors. He, he uses that to describe miraculous phenomenon. And his point there is these are not magic tricks to entertain people. These are miracles with a purpose. They have a purpose of leading you to a doctrinal conclusion. Because if you understand the rest of the Bible, if you understand, for example, that God sent bread from heaven down in the book of Exodus, then you are prepared to observe the phenomenon in John chapter 6 of Jesus you know, feeding the masses and then describing himself as the bread of heaven. Okay. It's a sign. It's not a magic trick. It's a doctrinal point. I'm going to do a miracle for the purpose of instruction so that you can understand what is going on and who I am. So, well said. Any other thoughts? Uh, so, there are some themes uh, within the Gospel of John. And one of them is, John makes no bones about this, that Jesus Christ is God. He declares it in the very first verse, in the very, it's, he, and, he, and he reiterates it throughout his book. Jesus Christ is God. Now, if you are familiar with the history of the church, how many of you have ever read about the Christological debates of the early church? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, this is a strange phenomenon, and it's something that kind of boggles my mind as a, as a, as a believer because... Early on in the church age, the, you know, the early church leaders got into this big fuss about, well, who is Christ? Exactly what is he? What is his nature? And, and one of the schools of thought was that 
he is not God, or if he is God, he's sort of a semi-God, or a demi-God, or a half-God, or something like that, or a diminished God. Uh, he's not quite really God. He's just sort of a really special guy. Uh, the, the scripture, and this is what confuses me, they have the same New Testament that we have. And the New Testament makes no bones about it. Jesus Christ is God, declared throughout the New Testament, and certainly in this book. So why did they come to these questions like this? Uh, you know, I suspect a big part of the problem was the Jewish nature or the Jewish foundation of Christianity. If you are a, if you are a, uh, a Judaizer, you're somebody who is a, a Pharisaical Jew, and a Christian comes up to you and says, Jesus Christ is God, how do you react to that? What is your first thought? Blasphemy. blasphemy. That's blasphemy. To say that a man is God is blasphemy. There is only one God. And, and so this, you know, this seeming problem of blasphemy was, was a big factor in, in causing this Christological debate as, as to whether Christ is truly God or not. But, but make no bones about it, you will see it in this Gospel. John is very clear. Jesus Christ is God. He is divine. Okay, He is fully divine. Um, you also notice in this, uh, in this Gospel that John uses the Greek word pistuo a lot, 98 times in this book, which is the word believe. It's a verb. Believe. Strangely, however, he never uses the noun form of the word pistis, which means faith. So if, if, you, th if you try to get into John's head, you know, you, you kind of get this sense that John is all about active process of belief all the time. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Active belief. Now he's not in, in, you know, what he says doesn't contradict Paul, but Paul is much more enamored with this word, pistis, which he uses all the time. John does not. John is telling you in verb form, believe, believe. And he's saying that to both unsaved people, believe so that you can be saved, as well as to Christians, believe, because active belief is as much a part of your life as it is as it, as it needs to be for, for an unsaved person. Active belief, despite pressure, despite uh, being persecuted, despite the doubts that, that come into everyone's mind, nevertheless, actively believe. John reiterates this throughout, the, throughout this book. It's a big theme of his. And he gives us reasons to, to have that belief. He talks a lot about life, light, and love. You know, his, his three L's. And he, and he basically comes to this conclusion. What is light? What is life? What is love? The answer is Jesus. Jesus is these things. You want to know what the ultimate definition of these things is? It's Jesus Christ. And so he spends a lot of time talking about Jesus as the light of the world. Jesus as life. Jesus as love. Okay, big theme in his, in his book, and particularly in the first chapter. Now, I want you to flip in your Bibles over to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Because there's a there's a really important connection to make here. If you want to learn how to connect the Bible with other parts of the Bible, if you want to, especially if you want to learn how to connect Old Testament to New Testament and how it all comes together in Christ, Notice here in Exodus chapter 3, uh, God is talking to Moses, verse 14, and, and, he's, and he's, ex he's explaining to Moses what his name is and what he's supposed to do with his name, what he's supposed to call God when he, when, because Moses is about to go back to the children of Israel and say, hey, my name's Moses. I know you people know me, don't particularly like me, but nevertheless, I am an agent of God, the God of our fathers. And by the way, I know what you're thinking. What is his name? Okay, now I'm going to give you his name. And what is the name of God? Verse 14, it says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am 
has sent me to you. In Hebrew, this is the tetragrammaton, which we add some vowel points to and come away with Yahweh. Yahweh. Y Yahweh, I am. Now, if you were an Israelite, and it was the year, give or take, 1400 B.C., and this very unimpressive, questionable character named Moses comes along one day and says, I am speaking to you in the name of the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm here to tell you that God has commissioned me to get ready for this, lead you out of this place, out of slavery, and into a distant land, the land of our forefathers, and the God who sent me has a name, and his name is I Am. What would be your reaction to that as you hear that for the first time? Prove it. Prove it? <laughs> Which is, that's a good point, you know, because he, you know, as you know from your study of the scripture, Moses' leadership is constantly in question. I mean, from the get-go, he's always being challenged, on, you know, on that point. So it has to be reiterated. But even, you know, even before I would get to that question, if I were literally, if I, if I were, had not been raised in the church, if I had no knowledge of Christianity and no knowledge of the Bible at all, and this guy steps in front of me and says, I'm here to tell you I have a message from God, and, and, and he's going to tell you his name. His name is I Am. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. I, I'd be sitting there, uh-huh. I, I am what? I, I am, finish the sentence, is this Jeopardy? What, what are we doing? Okay, I am what? And there's no answer in Exodus. I am. I simply, I am. I am the pre-existing one. You know, I, I am is the name of God in Exodus chapter 3. But in the Gospel of John, we finish the sentence. And we finish it seven times. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You want to know what I am? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd, as opposed to the bad shepherds that prophecy talks about. I am the resurrection and the life. There, I've just connected you to eternity future through the person of Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. <coughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life, he declares. No man comes to the Father but by me. Okay, very clear statement of how you obtain salvation. And he tells his close, intimate disciples, I am the vine. Do you want to know how you're going to live successfully as a Christian? Well, think of it this way. You're a piece of fruit, or you're like a plant. And I am the vine. Now you will notice from your background in farming and whatever in, in the agricultural world that when the plant gets separated from the vine, what happens to the plant? It dies. So if the plant wants to remain healthy, it must remain connected to the vine. And I am the true vine, says Jesus. Okay? So again, this is a, a, a major theme of the book of John. The book of John is written, you know, with a, a very strong presence of the Old Testament there. And he's, and he's completing the revelation of God. Exodus chapter 3 starts that revelation by saying, I am. And the Gospel of John completes it. What do you need beyond this? Nothing. This is the full expression of God. Jesus Christ is the full expression of God. Okay, so pretty, pretty strong theme. Um, now, John was dealing with, again, remember we said that John was writing late in the first century. And if you were a Christian late in the first century, you were going to come across some really wacko beliefs. Boy, aren't you glad those days are over. We don't have that problem anymore. But in the first century, there, were, there was this... You know, as we said, the, the, the onset of what would later become the great Christological debate. Who is Jesus Christ? What is his real nature? 
You know, we talk about him like he's a man. But if you talk to these people who embraced what is known as docetism, it comes from a, the Greek verb that means to seem, to seem like something. What the docetists were saying was, look, when you say that Jesus is, is a man, that's really, that's blasphemous to say that. It's wrong to say that. You're, you're disrespecting Jesus when you say that. Because men are sinful. Men are material. They're, they're flesh and blood. And flesh and blood is sinful. And therefore, Jesus, we know, cannot have anything to do with sin. So he wasn't really a man. He just seemed like a man. He looked like a man. It was an illusion so that he could minister to us. That's what docetism was saying. And so John addressed this early form of docetism, this, the, because this eventually <clears throat> comes into full bloom as Gnosticism. And the Gnostics, you know, would, had a very developed theology, and, it, and a lot of it was about how Jesus was not a man. Okay, but he was only a spirit. He's just a spiritual being. And so John takes that on. And he takes it on in the very first chapter. The Word became flesh. It doesn't say the Word looked like flesh. He, he became flesh. This is the great phenomenon that, that John talks about in chapter 1. This miracle, this, this unimaginable <coughs> phenomenon of a transcendent, eternal God becoming a human being. And, and John makes it very clear. That's what happened. The pre-existing Word of God became flesh, docetists. So you're wrong in what you're saying. Jesus Christ is a man. And He always will be a man. Okay? Forever. Eternally. And on the other side you had, now I call this Unitarianism, but it's really more than that. It's, you know, there was, Judaism was involved and, and some other influences, but there was another school of thought that said, Oh, we dig this idea that Jesus was a man. In fact, we've been saying that all along. We absolutely buy into his manhood. We get that. What we don't buy is the idea that he's God. That's blasphemy. And that, that's wrong. Because if he were God, and we know that there's God the Father, how can there be two gods? You know, because the Bible tells us, you know, Israel, your God is one God. We are the world's chief monotheist. We believe in one God. And now you Christians are coming along under the influence of this disgraced Pharisee Paul and telling us that there's three gods. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. We don't buy it. We believe in one God, and we don't believe that Jesus Christ was God. We believe he was a really good man. We'll give him that. So... John takes this on, and he says, no, the Word was God. He was with God, and he was God. All right, he, he declares, at the, at the, he tells the story at the end of the book, which we'll get to, is when Thomas, uh, the, the apostle, uh, after the resurrection, is insistent, he will not believe these other knuckleheaded disciples that Jesus actually rose from the dead. He's not going to believe that until he sees it for himself. And so then, he sees it for himself. And he declares to Jesus, my Lord and my God, he calls him. And Jesus does not reprimand him. Why? Because Jesus is his God. Jesus Christ is the God-man. Okay? That's the idea. So you understand these two false belief systems were somewhat on John's mind, I believe, as he's writing this gospel, and he wants to correct what he sees as doctrine that's beginning to slip away. All right, and this, the nature of Christ is at the very center of doctrinal error. Okay, questions about any of that? Any of you ever run into docetists or or uh, Unitarianisms or any of that? Unitarian. Huh? Unitarian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are alive and well today. Both these ideas are alive and well today. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an ongoing problem of heresy, and John takes it on because he's very interested in doctrinal uh, correctness. So, you know, we talk about the idea that John uh, is quite different from the Synoptic Gospels. And, why, you know, 
Uh, how different? Well, 93% of what you're going to hear in this gospel is not reflected in the, in the synoptics. You're going to get you are, you are going to get treated to a, a, a close inspection of intimate conversations that Jesus has with his disciples and others as he prepares them for apostleship, as he prepares them for the onset of the church age. His deepest, most intimate thoughts about his impending crucifixion, about his resurrection, and about the role of the comforter who is coming. We get to, we get to listen in, eavesdrop on these very intimate conversations in this gospel, but not in the synoptics. Uh, John doesn't talk about a lot of stuff that we would expect. You know, if John had set out to just simply write a biography of, of Christ, we would certainly expect him to talk about genealogy, as Matthew and Luke did, but he doesn't mention it. We would certainly expect him to tell us a Christmas story about the birth of Christ, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't mention it. Uh, he doesn't talk about the temptation of Christ. There's no demons being cast out. He doesn't talk about the parables that so fascinated Matthew and the other uh, writers. He doesn't talk about the transfiguration, although he himself was there and saw it. He alludes to it, but he doesn't describe it in, in detail. And although he talks quite a bit about the night of the Lord's Supper, he doesn't specifically mention the institution of the Lord's Supper as, as, a, as a part of the, the church ritual. And he doesn't really talk much about eschatology, as, as Matthew did, as Luke did, and as Mark did. So there's a lot that he doesn't talk about. But there's also a lot that he does talk about. You know, in this first point here, when I think about the Gospel of John, and I remember that John's a very, you know, he's an old man, very old man. You know, by the time he, he takes on this task to write John and then later write the epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then Revelation, he's a very, very old man, close to death. And so you think of John as this old church father, you know, kind of like the senior surviving apostle right and imagine yourself as a young Christian and it's you know it's about 90 AD and Jerusalem's been destroyed Christianity's getting persecuted and and you've you've got your hands on a copy of uh, you know say the Gospel of Matthew or Mark or Luke or maybe all three of them and you've been instructed in the details of the, the exciting life and exciting details of the life of Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, we come up to John, the elder apostle, and we say, John, what does it all mean? We, we want to hear from the senior apostle, the senior surviving apostle. What does it all mean, John? Explain it to us. And I picture John sort of you know, sitting down and sort of saying, OK, let me explain to you about what Jesus Christ is all about. Let me put it all together for you. That's the Gospel of John. It's not a episodic, you know, story of Jesus' life like the other Gospels are. It's a, it's a description of, of the meaning of Jesus Christ. Okay, philosophically, spiritually, and so on. He talks a lot about Jesus in Jerusalem, more so than the other uh, uh, apostles or the other Gospel writers do talks a lot about the Jewish feasts, and he, as I mentioned, he gives us very close uh, uh, you know, understanding of the, of the private conversations that he has, the preparation of the disciples, and what the Holy Spirit is going to do for the church, and for, you know, for the disciples, and by extension, for the rest of the church, uh, as this new age comes. Okay, so again, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it's a very exciting book in that sense, preparing us as church age believers for service and, and how uh, this new relationship we're going to have with the Holy Spirit. Okay, questions about any of that? Other stuff that, uh, or other thoughts on the, the contents? Yeah. Can you define eschatology? Eschatology is, uh, is, is the doctrine of last things, the doctrine of the end times. It comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last. Okay, and from that we get eschatology, the doctrine of last things. John doesn't talk a lot about it. Okay, not a big deal for him, or not a big, not a big issue. Um, and and why, why do you suppose that would be? Why, why is it that John conspicuously doesn't talk much about eschatology? It's funny because he's the guy who goes on to write Revelation, but 
you know, in this gospel, why not? Huh? Yeah, that's right. That's a great point. That, that, that it doesn't relate directly to his purpose statement, which is, you know, I'm trying to write something explaining the meaning of the life of Christ so that you can understand who Christ is and, there, and on that base an active belief for salvation. Okay, so yeah, you're, that's exactly right. It's, it's not part of his thesis. Other thoughts on this? Yeah. Well, it could be because it was already described. Yeah, and, and in part, yeah, in part because the synoptics have already dealt with it, and and you know, again, one of the things that he, I mean, he spends nearly half the book, okay, really on on this preparation of the disciples for apostleship and for the onset of the church age. So, if you ask John, at the time that he's writing this gospel, John, do you think about the future? Yeah, I do. Well, what are you really thinking about? What's what's occupying your attention about the future? His answer. The church age. The church age. Because that's coming and it's going to be huge and powerful. And it's going to be a fast moving phenomenon that's going to just take over the whole world. That's what John is thinking about. In Matthew 24, uh, you know, Matthew is focused on what Christ told them about the end times after the age of the church. But John is focused on the coming church age, very clearly. You want to say? Is that why, because it's so different from the synoptic gospels, is that why they put it in the last gospel? Yeah, you know, why do they yeah, why do they put it in the last gospel? Um, I think that's very much the reason. I, I think that the, you know, as they put the canon of scripture together, you know, the church fathers realized this is a strange character, this this gospel. Uh, conspicuously different from the others. Uh, so, so what do we do with it? Well, we put it last because, you know, I want to show you something uh, actually related to that point. Uh, you know, we sometimes call the Gospel of John the Deuteronomy of the Gospels. Okay, and if you think of the, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is, you know, literally, it's the, the word Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. Okay, the second law. It's the final word of Moses, the recap, the summary. It's, it's Moses' exodus saying, okay, I'm, I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to hand over leadership to Joshua. We're getting ready to move into the promised land. So here's my final interpretive word on the law of God, Deuteronomy, the wrap-up, the summary. And in the same way, the Gospel of John has that function for the Gospels. This is John, the elder apostle, saying everything these, these guys have told you, Matthew, John, Mark, Luke, they've given you a tremendous treasure trove of, of detailed, episodic knowledge about the life of Christ. Now I'm going to give you the recap, the summary, the interpretation of it all, okay, the wrap-up. And I think that's why it's, it's last. Yeah, other thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, you know, if you think of John, you know, as I mentioned, John is the famous author of the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse. So if you relate these two ideas, and you think about the two advents of Christ, okay, uh, according to the dispensational timeline, which you guys have totally memorized by now, and you could do this from memory, you know, the dispensational timeline, we have eternity past, Eternity past. We have the creation of the world, and here's Adam. Then uh, this period is uh, innocence. And then uh, we have sin that occurs, and so, you know, this is where Genesis chapter 3, sin occurs. And so then we have the uh, conscience, the age of conscience, where now, the, now nature is cursed, death begins as a phenomenon. And then, uh, you know, after that we have, uh, you know, Noah and, and the ark, and then we have the, the period of government, or the dispensation of government, and this is where, uh, uh, you know, after the flood, the post diluvian period, and, uh, and God says, uh, there's now, you know, I'm going to require man to put, put other men to death for the, for the crime of murder, you know, so, there, so this implies that there's going to be human government. And then uh, we call out history's first Jew, Abraham, 
And this begins the age of promise. Or the age of Israel. Very crucial age in understanding the Bible. Because during this, we have the period of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, the 12 tribes. And then we have the rise of the Davidic monarchy, the exile and return of, of Judah, the splitting, of course, of the nation into Israel, Judah, the exile of uh, Judah, the return. And then, 400 years after that, after the end of that, we have the arrival of Jesus Christ, the first advent of Jesus Christ who comes to die on the cross the substitutionary death dies is resurrected and ascended into heaven all during the age of Israel all during the age of promise and then shortly thereafter the new age comes along the one that so preoccupied John as he wrote this gospel the age of the church sometimes called the age of grace although there's grace in all dispensations but it's sometimes called that this will, will, of course, continue until Rapture Day, when the church is removed. Thereupon, we move into the seven-year tribulation. There's a great book about that called Revelation, for those of you who have studied that. And at the end of Revelation, we have the great second advent of Christ. And this time, he comes not to die on the cross, but to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords, to judge and to make war. And then we have, of course, the kingdom period that we sometimes call the millennium or the age of Christ. And then after that, the great white throne judgment of unbelievers and then eternity future. New Jerusalem comes down. The world is destroyed and remade. And that's the dispensational timeline. Now, the Gospel of John, where does it fit in? Well, just like his book of Revelation is... is is the apocalypse, the revealing of this period of time. This is what Revelation is about. So also the Gospel of John is about, what, about the first advent. It, it's the revealing, the apocalypse, the revealing of the first advent. You know, John was not the only one to, to talk, the only one in the Bible to talk about the tribulation. There's lots of talk about the tribulation in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. But what he does for us in this book is interpret it and bring it to a conclusion. Okay, and so and the same thing with the Gospel of John. John is not the only one to talk about the first advent of Christ, but he is the one who summarizes and interprets it for us, gives us, gives us uh, the meaning of it. As you're familiar with, uh, if you've studied these, Matthew is a very Jewish Gospel talking about Jesus Christ as the King, the Messiah. And he goes out of his way to prove over and over again, and he says repeatedly through his gospel, you know, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, proving he is the Messiah. Okay? Uh, Mark is talking about, you know, Christ's servanthood. And <clears throat> from, from this great book, we get, you know, the, that, that great verse that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, uh, a very short book, very action oriented book. It reads almost like a movie script. You know, he uses the word immediately a lot. And then, you know, Jesus immediately did this. And he cut. And he immediately did that. Cut. Next scene. You know, kind of that's the way Mark reads. And then Luke, you know, uses very sophisticated Greek, very highly educated physician who writes a very careful and carefully documented uh, gospel of Jesus Christ about all the different episodes in his life. And he presents him as a very human, you know, as, as Jesus the man is his emphasis. Although, of course, he recognizes his deity. And then the Gospel of John, which is talking to a much wider world and interpreting the meaning of the life of, of uh, Christ. Now, what are your thoughts, questions, issues with how John fits in? Any, uh, any thoughts on that? Yes? Is there any indication that uh, John knew about Paul's letters and vice versa? Uh, are there, is there any indication that John knew about Paul's letters? Let me think about that. Um, I don't. I don't know of any strong evidence in that direction. I mean, it, I. I almost assume that the answer to that is yes, but I don't. I don't know of any clear scriptural evidence in that direction. Besides Anyone can gospel. correct that. Pardon. Besides the gospel presentation. Yeah. Right. But I mean, uh, does anyone have any? You other. We have 
lots of fine Bible scholars in here. The question is, does is there any evidence that John had Paul's letters, the epistles of Paul? Yeah, it's a good point. I would just think, I mean, John was in Ephesus. Yeah, Paul right. Paul spent time in Ephesus and wrote the letter to the Ephesians. Yeah. Just from reading, I then I would... Yeah, it, it would be hard. It would be hard to imagine that these two had never met each other, or yeah. uh, well, we know that they met. We know that they met because they they certainly met face to face in Jerusalem. We you know there's a scriptural accounting of that. But the question about the epistles, uh, you know, you know, did he have them as reference material? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe the the type of gospel that he emphasized. It wasn't your king is here. True, yeah. and yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and, and you know, her point there is that that. Uh, you know John's presentation of the gospel in this book, as, and, and it's very clearly, very conspicuously, for John, it's about belief. That's it. There's no works associated with it. In fact, surprisingly, you know, and you know, half of you will storm out of the room when I say this, but you know, that's okay. This door's there. You know, but anyway, but there, surprisingly, when you when you read about John's handling of the gospel, he doesn't even use words that we want him to use. Words like repent. He doesn't use that word very much. He does, you know, it's very much about believe, and that's the word, you know, word he just uses over and over again. So, you know, in John 3:16, that whosoever believes in him, you know, you can imagine Nicodemus, and you know, when Mark taught this, Pastor Mark taught this uh, passage, he did such an excellent job, you know, because he, he you know, he, he he encouraged us to think about that passage as as if we were Nicodemus, you know, a Pharisaical, you know, Jew. And Jesus telling us, whoever believes in, you know, in the Son. Yeah, believes, believes. And what else? You know, what else? What about circumcision? What about the law? What about sacrifice? What about works? What about this? What about that? No, he said believe. All right, so, so that suggests to me that, you know, he knows, he, he probably knew and, and collaborated with Paul. Because Paul was very much, you know, in Ephesians, you know, your, your salvation is by grace, through faith. That's it, not of works. You know, so those two are preaching exactly the same theology, so that's a good point. Other thoughts? Yes? I can only think, uh, as far as John's, when he was writing, uh, in, in his time with, uh, with Jesus, and after that, <clears throat> he would have seen the, some of the heresy and the apostasy that was taking place, and he had to find, kind of focused, you know, trying to steer people away and get back to the fact yeah. That, uh, that uh, he, he was seeing what was happening. Yeah, that's as, as it was. Yeah, that, and that's kind of unique. And you know, Richard's point there is that that, that the, you know, by the time that, that John is writing, you know, which is, you know, t toward the end of the first century, John has seen what Paul did not see. That Paul, what Paul did not live to see, which is how the church is beginning to evolve and migrate, in some cases, away from the truth. Uh, into into heresy, and so he has to deal with that to some degree in this gospel. Yeah. So, other thoughts? Um, Please. It's interesting that if you look at the date there for Luke, um, that was actually a, very near the time that Luke was spending a lot of time with Paul yeah. on his missionary journeys, and so you and the fact that it was written in classic Greek, which Paul certainly knew, mm -hmm. um, makes me think that you know Luke Luke was certainly inspired to write that gospel, but Paul may have been with him oh, definitely. Yeah, some that, of that time, and yeah, so definitely it makes me, that. there was some interaction there. But yeah, yeah, no, they, you know, it's point, it, but. points well taken that, that uh, we, you know, we believe that Luke was closely associated with Paul, and so, you know, sometimes we think of his gospel as the gospel of Paul, you know, because of the, because of the Pauline influence there. Just as with Mark, we believe that John Mark was closely associated with Peter, and so, you know, it's all sometimes called the gospel of Peter. Um, so yeah, you, yeah, definitely the uh, um, the apostles were closely, you know, related to that. And of course, Matthew himself wasn't was one of the apostles, one of the uh, disciples of Christ, former tax collector. So uh, so yeah, uh, so this this uh, this book fits in, you know, has a unique place, you know, among the gospels, and it's a uh, fun to read for that reason. Yeah, um, I seem to recall hearing somewhere, I think, in FBC that Revelation was probably. Right. What's, what's, the, what's the timeline of that stage? Yeah, uh, I, I believe that Revelation was written in the 90s, uh, probably no earlier than the 90s, uh, because it was written toward the end of, of John's life while he's in exile on the Isle of Patmos uh, as, a, as a really old man. And, uh, so I, I think it's 
I, I think it must clearly be well after the destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem, in, in my view. But uh, yeah. Before the gospel, after the gospel, about the same time. I, I would say probably after the gospel, because you get the sense that he wrote this gospel as he's still actively involved with churches in Ephesus, because the belief is that he wrote this in Ephesus while he was ministering in Ephesus, uh, and and you know you get the sense from the gospel that he's. You know, he's writing to people that he's actively involved with, encouraging them in their lives and so on. Revelation is kind of a, wow, this weird thing happened to me when I was a really old man and about to die. Okay, I got this bizarre, you know, revelation of, of what the end times is going to look like. You know, it's kind of his final word, but yeah. What do you want to say? Can you explain that John's gospel is the apocalypse? Yeah, well, the word apocalypse means the unveiling. That's what the word means. It's a, okay. it's unveiling. And we don't use the word, I don't use the word apocalypse as the world uses it, right, which right. is like, it's a catastrophic end of the right. world. No. it's the, the word apocalypse is a Greek word that means to pull a blanket off something, to pull a cloak off something and reveal it. Okay? And this is why the book of Revelation is called the book of Revelation. It's a book of revealing. Yeah, it's, a, it's an apocalypse, a pulling back to show you the end times. The, go the Gospel of John is a pulling back to show you the first advent and what the first advent is about, what it means. Okay? Yeah, it's a good question. It's probably, uh, probably it's more confusing than anything else when I wrote that. Other thoughts? Yes. So you could say that the book of John, if you're if you're looking at John sitting there writing, he's saying, look, this is what is critical. Yep. This is what you have to stay true to. Yeah. If you get off of that track, you're going to have all kinds of other issues. So yeah. he's looking at what everybody else has done and said, based on all of that, this is your focus. Right. Then right. when Revelation comes in, he goes like, holy smokes, there's some interesting things coming. Yeah. But don't forget, this is what's critical. Because right. if there's no belief, right. you're in trouble. Yeah. That's got to yeah. be. Yeah, well said. And so, like, so, so along those lines, if you were to say to somebody, like, you know, a, you, you meet somebody on the street and they say, Christianity, what's that? And you want to say to them, do you want the essentials of Christianity? Right. The bottom line fundamentals, you find right here in this book. Okay, Th This book is a normative passage on salvation. Okay, Now, there are, salvation is talked about in many other ways in the Bible, in many other places in the Bible. But if you want a normative passage that takes on the subject head on and explains it in crystal clear terms, this is where you go. Okay, it's for, this is your first stop. And like you say, it's a lot about orthodoxy and how to stay straight on who Christ is and, and you know, what is the nature of, of our Christian life. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the structure of John is very simple. Very simple. He has a public ministry for 12 chapters. And then from chapters 13 through 21, it goes private. Okay, so, yeah, you know, it, it's kind of, again, a peculiar structure. Uh, all the public stuff and the episodes and the signs happen on the front end in 12 chapters. And then from that point on, John gives us a, a, a very close view of the intimate discussion going on between Jesus and his disciples as he prepares to commission them as apostles into the age of the church. Okay, pretty pretty simple way to think about the, the structure of John. Now, I want to want to start off with John chapter 1, verse 1, so I can actually say that we actually taught the gospel of John, you know, this this week. You know, that would be a great accomplishment. Uh, so we only have two semesters with this book, so we're going to have to go along in a fairly good clip. But uh, let's begin with John chapter 1, verse 1. And it starts out with uh, a very famous verse that all of you probably have memorized, and it starts out with these words, in the beginning, in the beginning. Now, when you read those words, in the beginning, does that remind you of something? Yeah, if you're a good Bible student, of course you immediately say, oh, in the beginning, well, that takes me back to Genesis, the book of Genesis, because that's where Genesis begins, in the beginning. Do you think that was a really cool coincidence? Well, if you said that it was a cool coincidence, John would roll over in his grave and say, no, it wasn't a coincidence. I did that on purpose. That's what I wanted you to think of. Because if you're, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you're a good Jewish believer, for example, and you're familiar with the Bible, you know all about Genesis. It's the first book of the law. And you know all about the Creator. 
Moses taught us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But I'm here to supplement that and tell you something even more exciting, okay? Uh, so, the, so you made that connection, but then here's the question. Moses said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Which beginning was earlier? Or are they the same? Huh? Yeah. John is doing something remarkable, almost, you know, I wouldn't say blasphemous, but almost, um, you know, he's being, he, he's really putting forward a whole new thing and going well beyond what Moses told us. Because Moses only takes us back to when, when the earth was created. John deliberately takes us back earlier than when the earth was created. Tells us about stuff in eternity past that no one could possibly have witnessed except for the God-man. He witnessed it, and he told John. So John tells us, in the beginning was the Word. You know, uh, Bob, yes? I think your microphone went off. Yeah. Did it? No, it did How about that? You know, it looks like the battery's dead. Well, that's not going to be a problem for you guys, because I can, I can definitely, I, I can sound off. But the, thank you, though. Um, so, so the point here is, um, you know, Moses takes us back to creation and gives us this sort of veiled, a little bit scary, you know, glimpse of this burning cloud, God, I am, Yahweh, I am. But John, the Gospel of John, takes us back before creation, and, and it says in this gospel that, that Jesus Christ will declare God. He will declare him. And that means he's going to explain him. He's going to lay the whole thing out, remove all the mystery, and tell us who God is. And show us who God is. And demonstrate in his own life who God is. There will be no doubt by the time you get to the end of, of the gospel of John. There's a little... There's, we have legitimate questions about the nature of God at the end of Exodus. But John is going to answer those questions. And he's going to let us see God. He, you know, he tell, he's going to tell his disciples this, because his disciples are asking the same questions that you and I would ask if we were with Jesus. They said, show us God. Show us, show us the Father. And what did Jesus say? If you see me, you see the Father. I love that verse. That verse is a great encouragement to me as, as a Christian because, you know, how many of you have done this where, I don't know, sometimes you can't, you can't sleep at night and you're thinking about your life and you're thinking about Christianity and you start thinking about God. You know, when I think of God the Father and I have this picture in my mind of this, you know, dark, scary universe with this transcendent, pre-existing invisible spiritual God who appears in a burning cloud and it's and just like and, and he's eternal he's eternal you know has that ever bothered you that he had no beginning and he had no I mean everything I know has a beginning I have a beginning everything has a beginning but God does not has no beginning and so I lay in my bed thinking about that and it freaks me out because I can't get my head around it. It's like, what does that even mean? That's scary when I think that that's the God I'm connected to. And then I remember Jesus said, do you want to understand that? Do you want to you see the Father? Do you want to understand who he is? Then look at me. If you see me, you've seen the Father. That's very encouraging because I can understand Jesus, I can, you know, there, there'll be a time when I can reach out and touch his hand and feel the warmth of his flesh. He, he understands me, and I, to some degree, understand him. He's a man. I can see that. Okay, and, and so he tells us, that's part of my ministry. I'm here to be one of you, and if you see me and hear me and, and live with me, you'll understand the Father. Everything you need to know about him is right here. You'll find it right here. One stop shopping. Okay? Very encouraging. Very encouraging idea. So 
Again, very powerful that we have this gospel. So here's what it says in Greek. Enarche ein holagas kai holagas en pros ton theon kai theos ein holagas. Did you get that? Now the reason I show that to you is because you'll see a word there repeated several times. Right there. Holagas. The word. Okay, that's what it means. So, in the beginning was the word, holagas, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, this brings, of course, the question up, why in the world would God the Holy Spirit, working through John the Apostle, come up with this name to introduce the summarized synopsis biography of Jesus Christ? Why does God, why does the Bible, why does John refer to Christ as Holagos, the Word? What are, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, let me just give you a quick look ahead. Here's some names for Jesus in the Bible. He's got a lot of names. But John chooses a title not used before, the Word was with God. Why does he call him that? What does that suggest to you, if anything? Yeah? Because the entire Bible points to him. Okay, because the entire written Word of God points to the living Word of God. Great point. Anything else? Yeah? Because um, he was writing to the Greeks, and the Greeks kind of saw logos like logic. It's also like a sort of fate, and it was the closest thing they had academically yeah, this is a great point. That, that you know, She brings out the point that, you know, you remember we said that in part John is writing to Greeks. And his use of this title, Holagos, is, is something that the Greeks would sit up and take notice about. You know? Now, the way he uses this word is going to be different from the way they understand it at first. And that's why he's going to spend a lot of time explaining exactly what he means by Holagos. Because he's going to say something that they've never heard. That's going to blow them right out of their seats. He says, the Word became flesh. Okay, that, that is something miraculous that, that the Greeks are going to have to try to deal with, you know, in, in this gospel. So, yeah, your point's well taken. What else? I, I just have a question. So, um, a while back, Mark Carey did a um, sermon and we talked about referencing Genesis 1 with this prologue. Yeah. Um, and I, I just have some notes from that scripture as well. But he said the word was the God, is God, and then the light is Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So here we're saying that God is Jesus, Jesus is God, and that the word is what uh, John is calling Jesus. But what about the light then? Because he still yeah. does say God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about yeah. the light. Yeah, he's John is about to bring in light and life as well. And and it's and again, why does he do that? Because where else do we read about light and life? In Genesis chapter one. Same thing. So John very much has that in view, and when we get to that verse, we will answer that. Yeah, okay. go ahead. I thought I thought it was, that was his role in the Trinity. Yeah. He was the word that spoke. Right. Answers. Yeah, and this is exactly. In Latin, it's where boom, which is where we get our word verb from. It yeah. gives you that action sense of that the word is the action, yeah. the physical. That's great. That's a good. That's that's a good insight. So so you know, our point there is that that the the idea of calling Christ the Word suggests to us that that is part of His role in the Trinity. That He is the communicator, the great communicator. You know, uh, there's God transcendent inscrutable and then there's the word to explain it all and to communicate with mankind so yeah good point that's all just uh, yeah just the word word uh, we um, we communicate with words and we understand each other with words well for the most part and Jesus is the word in the sense that God communicates in Jesus and we understand God like you said earlier in Jesus too yeah exactly and that, and you said it really well and, that, and this is the so, so this is the idea. This is what John is telling us here. Okay, you, you want to understand who Christ is and what he is. and what's, what's the meaning of it all? Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is the Word. 
Okay, he, he is the Word of God. He is God. He became flesh, but He's the Word of God. He's the, he's the communication, the expression of God. So, yeah, uh, go ahead here, and then I'll get here. Yes? Maybe a stretch, but I almost tend to think of it as the truth. Yes. Word means That's, truth. You know, yep. you have spoken word, you know, we talk about logic, but yeah. reason. But this is the truth. I don't think that's a stretch at all. I think and, you're right and, on the money. Yeah, that's, I, a, that's a great insight, actually. Because, because yeah, you go from he is the word, the expression, and then John and Christ himself will take will, will, will then further that by saying, and by the way, I am the truth. the truth. And that's important because you're surrounded by lies. You're surrounded by lies and hypocrisy and falsehood and, and, and error. But I am the truth. Not just the word, but the truth. So yeah, I think that's exactly right. You should definitely make that connection. So does that fit in with the word is also the authority? So this is the final authority. Right. So you could That's a good point. You could use that word in there too. Yeah, so word. John's, and John's job is to say this is it. Yeah. He yeah, is yeah. I like that. Authority. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that. But the, but the her point there is that the word uh, the word of God, meaning the authoritative declaration of God. It's like, you know, if you're in the military and they say, well, what's the word from the commander? Okay, that means, <coughs> what's the orders? What are the orders? And, and so this is the point of, yeah, that's a great point. That, that, you know, this is God's authoritative expression of, you want to know what salvation is? This is it. And there is no other. You want my marching orders for eternal life? It's Christ. Those are the, those are the orders. That's the word. Great point. Yeah. I think it's interesting too that in Genesis God spoke yeah, and it was absolutely. created. And also in Revelation you have yeah. Jesus speaks. Right. And so that whole idea of his word and yeah. going back to her point with authority. Yeah, and it, again, these are great points. And you know, she brings up the point, uh, and it's it's a necessary point to make here, is that you know John's gonna make the argument, we'll probably have to get it next week, but John's gonna make <laughs> the argument here in a moment that Jesus Christ is the creator. And it's and it's no coincidence that he's called the word. Because immediately, as a good, you know, good Jewish Bible student, we think back. Well, how did? What was the act of creation? What was the act of creation? How did God do that? He kind of, you know, put a bunch of stuff in a vat and mix it up, and there was a big bang. No, He spoke, and creation happened. He spoke. He spoke a word, and now we we hear about the word. Okay, that He is the word. Yeah. I'm remembering uh, Lagos also carries with it the idea of reason. Yeah. Um, right. Rationalism. That's another great point. The reason for being. Yeah. The purpose. Yeah, and and this is this is important. And and John John is going to make reference to this because he's about to make the argument that not only is Jesus the Lagos, but he's also the light of man. And light follows that that very point that you're making that that light meaning intelligence, understanding, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So word leads to light. Word leads to life and light. You know, is the argument that he's about to make. It's a splendid. Really, it's a splendid truth, you know, that, that John is talking about. It, you know, big time, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big philosophical, spiritual understanding of the meaning of Jesus Christ. And, you know, it has everything to do with word, communication, authority, light, life. This is, this is, this is who Jesus is. This is the meaning of it, of, of his life, you know, kind of thing. So pretty cool. Other thoughts? Um, so, you know, I kind of made this point where, like, when I, you know, this is what I think of when I think of God, you know, when I'm laying in my bed at night, you know, this, you know, expanse with this, I don't understand it, it's big, scary, inscrutable, okay, you know, what am I going to do with this, he's omnipotent, but the Bible says that in the beginning, in the beginning, this is eternity past now, this is before Moses' beginning, way back before creation even started, before creation even started, there was a Lagos. And that tells you that from the very start, even before the start, God intended to communicate himself to people that weren't even in existence yet. Because he, of course, foresaw all this and foreknew it. Uh, you know, some scholars would make the point that in Aramaic, which was kind of the language, the lingua franca of Palestine uh, during the incarnation, the word memra, which means word, was used as a, a, to translate the Old Testament into Aramaic for the word God. So the idea of using the word word to describe God is, is already, that, that precedent was already there in Aramaic. Uh, but, you know, as far back as, as you can reach with your human mind, 
as far back into eternity past as you can reach, God intended to talk to you, to communicate to you, to reach out to you, to provide salvation for you, and to ultimately raise you from the dead and bring you home into eternity. God thought that stuff through in eternity past. Okay, yes, Joel? I'm Yeah. Right, right. That's a great point. So, and, and communicate with him. Yeah, so Joel's taking us back to, to Genesis where the, the Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God. And, and again, this, this then kind of completes that whole thought because as Joel's pointing out, the Logos was there with the intention to communicate, with the intention to reach out to creation, and then creation was made in the image of God with a spirit, with, with an intelligence, with a soul that could receive the word. So, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Do you think it also refers to how God in Trinity, how he communicates with the other persons of the Trinity? Yeah, does, does, it, you know, does it relate, you know, what, what does it show us with regard to the Trinity and the, and the interaction of the Trinity? You know, you bring up a good point, and, and I... You know, we, we need to explore that further as we go, I think, you know, in this chapter and in, in this gospel, uh, about how that works exactly, because I, uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, fairly mysterious subject in the Bible. But, but one of the things that's, that's odd to me about this whole, this whole verse is that, uh, you know, it, it has to do with this, uh, well, it has to do with the deity of Christ, but, but what I want to get to was this idea that, the very fact that it says, in the beginning was Hologos, and Hologos was with God, and was God, you know, if you knew nothing about Christianity, you knew nothing about the word Trinity, you knew nothing about any of that, but you read that verse, you get a picture in your mind of two persons, right? Two persons, God and the Word. And we're told that they're with each other, and they're also, they are each other. You know, the Lagos is God. So that brings up this whole question of the Trinity. What is that relationship? Well, you know, what, are they two persons? Are they the same person? Well, you know, how, and this is kind of the stuff that the, that the early church had to struggle with, because these are, these are deep waters, you know, and we, we'll continue to get at that question, because it's a great question. Uh, but, you know, it also brings up this issue of the deity of Christ. We have to conclude here. We'll, uh, we'll pick this up next week. But, but uh, you know, as I, as I was mentioned before, that the early church struggled with this idea that Jesus is God. And, of course, as, as you know, 21st century New Testament church age Bible, you know, Christians, we look at the early church and say, what the heck was your problem? What's your problem? The, the scripture makes it crystal clear that Jesus Christ is is God. It says it in the Gospel of John. It says it in Philippians, who being in the form of God, the, the morphe of God, did not consider it, and the robbery is a terrible translation. It, it, the, what it says there is, did not consider Godhood something to be retained and hold, held on to. That's what it means. It's not robbery. I don't know where King Jim got that idea. Okay, so, but, but then of course in Colossians, uh, it talks about, uh, it talks about, uh, he that is Christ is the image. The Greek word there is icon, from which we get the English word icon. Uh, a picture, a picture, you know, the, the visible picture. He is the image of the invisible God. In him all the pleroma exists, the fullness of God. And this is what this is such an important point, the fullness of God. Because the Gnostics would come along in the first century and tell you, in the second and third century, would tell you, well, yeah, this Christianity stuff, this Jesus stuff, that's fine. That's fine. No, fine. We like that. It's fine. But if you want the full, complete experience of spirituality and God, well, then you've got to come into Gnosticism, you know, because we have the full. And Paul says, no, you want the fullness? You want the, the absolute fullness of spiritual experience? You find it in the person of Jesus Christ and nowhere else. You don't need any supplement to that. Okay, it's, he is the fullness of God. Okay, so again, this declaration of his deity. And, we'll, and I'll stop right here. In Hebrews 1, uh, you know, starting at verse 1, he says, uh, the writer of Hebrews says that Christ being the brightness and express image, literally in Greek, 
the character. That's what this word is right here in Greek. It's the, it's the word from which we get character. Now, what does it mean? What does character mean in Greek? It doesn't mean the same thing as it means in English. This word means, if you, if you imagine like a soldering iron that, that goes and puts a, burns an imprint into something, that's what that word means, okay? It means that, that God burned his image into human flesh, and Christ is the result, okay? And in the incarnation, he took on the character of God, okay, is the idea, all right? We will discuss the incarnation and this idea of God and man uh, more as we, uh, as we reconvene next week and then uh, finish up chapter one. Any other uh, questions, comments? Feel free. Yes? I was going to say, it's interesting, uh, classic 70 years ago, when you talked to uh, teenagers or even folks in the early 20s, if they said something that you may agreed with, they thought was really true, they would get word. Word, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. They really didn't understand yeah. how they were using that in, in this context. Yeah. The real living word was much more than whatever we were saying. Yeah. And I'd say the other point that goes to this about God uh, is using being one to say, uh, I work at a school that's Methodist affiliated. And they did a whole uh, sermon series on half truths, and one that they kept coming back to was that uh, the Bible is written by man. So you can see how they can take all this stuff and twist it because it's not really God speaking; it's man speaking. Yeah. So therefore, you can question everything and you can make up your own word. Right, right. And, yeah. Well, and this is this is an example. This is an example of a piece of scripture. That, that absolutely counts on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because if John came up, you know, some guy who was Jesus' friend and said, oh, Jesus is God, we'd say, well, you're his friend. Of course you're going to say that. But the Holy Spirit speaking through John, revealing divine, absolute truth to us, that's a whole different story. So, yeah, yeah, good point. Others? Yes, please. Just real quick, uh, in order to be fair to the King James uh, use of the word robbery, yeah. the word meanings change. Yeah. So the robbery might have been at yeah. the, in 1611 the appropriate yeah, a, word. Yeah, a bit of an anachronism. Read that word and said, oh, yeah, something to be grasped. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, but, but, the, yeah, but the point there is yeah. Paul is saying Jesus had every right to hold on to his deity. He had every right to do that, but chose not to. He emptied himself instead. That's, that's his point. So, yeah. For the Philippians part, is it saying Jesus didn't feel like he had to sneak or like no. to steal it? No, no, no. That's, that's why I said I don't like the word robbery. What it literally says in Greek is this, that he being in the morphe of God, the form of God, made a decision. And his decision was, okay, I, I have divinity. I have it right here. It's mine. Not yours. It's mine. I could keep it. I could hold on to it. I could insist that everyone defer to me as God forever, or I could wipe them out if I wanted to. But instead of doing that, because I love you, because I love my creation, I am going to empty myself of divine privilege, and I am going to go to the earth and minister and die the substitutionary death. And this is why we have this fascinating encounter in the, in the Gospels in which, in which Christ says to the Pharisees, you can get away with blaspheming the Son, but, you, but blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. The, the amazing part of that verse is not the part about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The amazing part is that you can get away with blasphemy of the Son, that that could be forgiven. Why could that be forgiven to blaspheme the Son of God? Why? Because he, he made a decision not to grasp that, not to hold on to it, but to let it go, that divine privilege, so that he could minister and die the substitutionary death. Because if he had held on to it, how, how could you crucify God? You can't crucify God, but you can crucify a man who has emptied himself of divine privilege. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Others? Okay. So, see you next week. Do well.